Hello and welcome to a Talmud Israeli production. Today we'll review the highlights of this week's course of Daf Yomi study, Moed Katan 25 through 29, and Masachet Chagiga pages 2 and 3. 25. Amina bachula avelim belola aveda, shehi lemunucha ve'anu anacha. So this is a comment that was made by Bar Avin uh, to Bar Kipuk when he was asked about how he would eulogize Rav Ashi if Rav Ashi were to die. So in fact, this is not an actual eulogy, but it's a theoretical eulogy in case it would happen. And it's, he would say, Bechula Avelim, cry over the fate of the mourners, Velola Aveda, but not for the lost item itself, meaning the deceased person. Shehila Menucha, because the deceased person is going to their eternal rest. They're going to be happy in the afterworld. Vanula Anacha, but we who remain behind are saddened and are in our agony over the loss of a great man. Now, this was not well received by Ravashi, and ultimately, uh, Baravin was not allowed to speak at his funeral. 26. Tanu Rabbanan, Chola Shemet Lomet, En Modin Oto, Shema Titerefta Ato Alav. If a person is very ill, gravely ill, and they're near death themselves, but it turns out one of their relatives died, we don't inform them that, they have a, that their relative died and they should now sit Shiva and be an Avil. Why? Because we're afraid that if we tell them this bad news in their precarious state, that they themselves might die or go crazy. So better they shouldn't know, and either they'll find out when they recover, or maybe they'll never find out if they're in a, such a bad state, they themselves are going to lose their life soon. And this does happen. This happens in scenarios where you have an elderly patient uh, who's in a sensitive condition, or where multiple people, people are injured simultaneously, and we wouldn't want the bad news of the loss of a loved one to have an adverse effect on the health of the remaining person. Then, we don't tear kriya, uh, the tear of the garments, in the presence of a person whose health might decline further if they find out that someone died. And we silence the ladies in the presence of this sick person on the assumption that they might be overly talkative uh, and reveal something that we'd rather they not reveal. And we tear the garment of a child who lost a, a loved one, not because the child is obligated in the laws of Kriya, but rather we want to uh, increase the agmas nefesh, the, the, the pain, the emotional uh, intensity for everybody else, who they see, oh, this child lost a loved one, they're tearing Kriya, it's so sad, it's so sad. And so the effect is produced, more so than any halachic obligation. 27. So in the olden days, they would cover the faces of the poor people who died, but they would leave exposed the faces of the wealthy people who died, on the premise that the wealthy looked good, but the poor looked ugly because they were their faces were darkened by the effects of famine and drought and suffering. But the poor people were embarrassed that here their loved ones went covered on the premise that they're ugly, and the rich people, they the dead, were exposed. So they made a rule. We're now going to cover the faces of everybody out of respect for the poor people. This is one of several actions that were taken to make more egalitarian the funerary practices of Judaism, so as not to embarrass any particular group, whether poor people or any other type of group. We're all going to do this things the same way. And so the open casket is very un-Jewish. 28. If a person dies at 50, that's the death of karet, of the penalty of spiritual excision. If you die at 52, that's the death of Samuel, the prophet. Shmuel Haramati, he died at 52. If you die at 60, that's considered death at the hands of heaven. Shivim Seva, if you reach 70, that's old age. Shmonim Mivurot, if you reach 80, that's considered great strength. Now, in the olden days, before modern medicine, to reach 80 was pretty impressive. Nowadays, these numbers don't seem as impressive because lifespan has... has, has extended considerably. But still, the uh, the days of the Talmud, they were concerned that if you died at a particular age, it was indicative of either some sort of punishment or some kind of reward for righteousness. Chavtet. If you go from the synagogue to the yeshiva, or from the yeshiva to the synagogue, vice versa, you will merit receiving the divine presence. Go from strength to strength. So this is a concept that 
we should be focusing our lives on religious activities, intellectual and purely spiritual of davening. And so you go to Shachrit in the morning, you say your early morning prayers, and then you go to the house of study and you learn some Torah. Or you go from the house of study and you go back to the synagogue for the Mincha Marav. If one can arrange one's schedule to go from one to the other, or if, in fact, if learning and, and, and praying happen in the same location, then you will have achieved greatness. Now, Masechet Chagiga, Dafbet. Misha Chetzio Eved, Chetzio Ben Chorin, if a person was half slave and half free, we're talking about a person who was an Eved Kena'ani, who was owned by two people, and one master emancipated him, and one master did not emancipate him. So the problem is, this person is stuck, they can't really do anything, they can't get married because they're a half a Jew, and they can't get uh, um, married to a slave girl because they're a half... Uh, uh, a Jew. So they really have no choice in terms of matrimonial prospects. So we, what do we do? Olam For improving the fate of the world and the fate of this person, we force the other master to emancipate this individual, and that makes them no longer an evident at all, full-fledged adult Jew, and then they can marry an adult Jewish woman. Okay. Gib. In the lands formerly known as Ammon and Moab, where the Ammonites and the Moabites lived, which is to the east of Eretz Yisrael, the rule was enacted that you have to give Maser Ani, the poor man's tithe, in the sabbatical year. Now, ordinarily, in the sabbatical year, there are no tithes. But the problem is that this is not really Eretz Yisrael, and the poor people are desperate for food. And in the sabbatical year, when there's no work, there's a, there's a decline in the raw output of produce. So, Matam, how could this happen? How could they decree that there's Maaser in the seventh year? There were many places in, in the vicinity of Israel that were conquered by those who came out of Mitzrayim, meaning the first commonwealth. But they were not conquered by those in the second commonwealth, those who came back from Babylonia. Because Kedusha Rishon HaKitshel HaShah, the Lekitshel Lavo, that the first sanctification of Israel was only temporary, and it, it lapsed with the demise of the first commonwealth. And so when... Uh, Ezra came back and sanctified Eretz Yisrael again, certain areas were left unconsecrated in order so that those areas not have the sabbatical rule apply, that rather people could work the field in the seventh year, and in that seventh year of the produce that was, uh, that was uh, gained, a tenth of it was going to go to the Aniim, the poor men, to help them get through what was otherwise a difficult year. Everyone have a great week.